We're starting this series on stories of courageous faith. And we're going to be learning from Elijah and Elisha. Elijah and Elisha, they're not the same guy. Just like this morning before each of our services, uh, we had high school age twins, two different sets of high school age twins that are part of Shoreline Church do a little game show on Elijah or Elisha. Could you tell who's who, who's, which story is which? Because as twins, these young guys know that that's kind of the, you know, that people have questions about, about twins. And well, Elijah and Elisha were not twins, but people get them mixed up sometimes. And so we're going to be learning from them for four weeks, uh, opening God's word and learning together. And we're going to be talking about courageous faith. And you say, well, what is courageous faith? You know, courageous faith is when, when you stand up for what you believe, even when other people don't agree with you. That takes courageous faith. If you say, this is what I believe, I'm not being pushy, I'm not being mean, I'm just saying, this is what I believe and I'm not compromising. It takes courage to live with courageous faith. It's when you follow God in the good times and you'll still follow God in the low times, the painful times, the difficult times. That takes courageous faith. To hold on to God's hand when things are well and going good, but also hold on to God's hand when things are not going well and we're struggling. Courageous faith is, is when you say, I'll take chances and I don't know how something's going to turn out. It's, it's not taking a chance if you say, I know the result. <laughs> this is easy. But you say, I, I feel like God's calling me to take this step. I feel like God's calling me to do this. And I don't know exactly how it's going to turn out or what's on the other side. That takes courageous faith. And Elijah and Elisha are these, these amazing examples. Uh, they're stories of courageous faith. They walk through the highs and lows of life. And so they did this by radical and absolute following of God. Uh, and, and that leads to just amazing things. Uh, Elijah and Elisha were ready to follow God, whatever God called them to do. And some of those callings were, were unique and strange. And when you read their stories, you're like, man, this is wild. What's going on? But they were committed to follow God, whatever he called them to do. And so, so Elijah and Elisha have some things in common. And, and so I'll look at some of the common things, and then also we're going to learn how quite different they were as well in the coming weeks. So both Elijah and Elisha followed God boldly. They both said, I will follow God with confidence, whatever he calls me to do. And here's the beauty. We can do that too. You can follow God boldly. It's knowing where God's calling you and stepping into it even when it's challenging. Elijah and Elisha experienced a powerful and shocking movement of God. You read their stories. There's times where they follow God boldly and God would do stuff. You're just like, wow, crazy, wild. And I think we can experience that too. I think the more boldly we follow after God, the more we see God do things where we go, I could have never done that. That was not me right there. That was the power of God. And you get to experience that when you follow God with courage. And also both Elijah and Elisha saw God use them for great things. Not only did God, God do great things, but God took them and used them for things that were just amazing. You read their stories and you might say, man, I, I wish God could use me in a great way. Then follow him with courage. Follow him with boldness. And, and God's great things could impact one or two lives or 50 lives. But God wants to do great things through us if we'll have the courage to follow him with boldness. And so let me ask you a question as we jump into looking at Elijah, the first, the first of, these, uh, of these two men. And you're going to get to see their differences as we go along. Today we're going to focus on, on Elijah this week and next week. And here's my opening question for you. If you like what I'm going to say right now, raise your hand. If you like or love roller coasters, raise your hand. Okay, good. Put your hands down. How about not so much? Okay, see, roller coasters are one of those kinds of things that divide the human family. It's like you like, you tend to love them or just let me keep, keep me away from them. But when you read, when you read Elijah's story uh, in, in 1 Kings, and that's where we're going to be today in the book of 1 Kings, when you read Elijah's story, it's like a roller coaster. Highs and lows, troughs and mountaintops, ups and downs all through his life. And so as I was preparing this series, and I'm going to have the privilege of preaching three of the four messages in this series, as I was preparing this series, I was thinking about Elijah and, and like one of his highlights, one of his high points, you know, one of his high points was uh, on Mount Carmel where he won a victory in God's power over 850 false prophets. It was, basic, it was basically Elijah and God against 850 false prophets. And God had this victory. So, you know, that, that's the story of great, this high moment. But also in Elijah's life, there's a story where he's very depressed, very discouraged, very down. And he says, basically, my, wife, my, 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 my life's not worth anything. And so here's this guy, how could somebody have that kind of high and that kind of low? Because he was a real human being. <laughs> and real human beings have those moments. So, so what I did is I went to read his story in, in 1 Kings chapters 17, 18, and 19. And that's what we're going to look at today, those three chapters. Here's what hit me as I was reading it. His life was like a roller coaster. 
it was like, you know, some, some people's lives are kind of like, they're kind of even, but they're kind of like, oh, little, little ups and downs as you go on. But, but Elijah had like this boom, boom, boom. And it seemed like sometimes the, the high and the low were like back to back. Something amazing would happen, and then there'd be a tough time. Something tough would happen, all of a sudden something great would happen. And so, so what I want to do is I want to walk you through, uh, through Elijah's story, and I want you to just listen uh, and so normally I would have all the passages on the screen, but I'm going to read a lot of passages today uh, as, as we walk through this. And as we do, normally I would have it for you at home, I'd have the passages on the screen. Uh, but I'm not going to today because I want you just to listen to the story. I want you to get the narrative, the flow of his life. And I want you to feel like you're on, kind of on this roller coaster with Elijah because some of you are going to go, man, that's my life. My life seems to have these highs and lows, and hopefully it'll encourage you to realize that Elijah, who was a courageous follower of God, who loved God, still had great lows as well as great highs. So we're going to meet him in chapter 17, verse 1. And I call this one of the low moments for Elijah. And so I'm going to start kind of down over here, down on the steps, and, and take it down a little bit here. So, so in, in 1 Kings 17, 1, we, we begin with these words. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, now Ahab is the king of Israel, all right? So he says to the king, he says to King Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, and I want you to notice that because what he's saying is, as the Lord lives whom I serve, he's saying, I'm a prophet. I'm bringing God's word to you. This isn't my thing. This isn't my deal. He's saying, I'm speaking on behalf of God. So he's clear what he's coming. He says, as the Lord of Israel lives, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve. And then he brings the bad news. There will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. He brings tough news. There's going to be no dew and no rain for years in a very arid, deserty area. That's the last thing you want to hear if you live in Israel, because it's a desert. But he's bringing God's message. What happens, and this is why it's a down moment, is Ahab absolutely blames him. Ahab blames the messenger. And Ahab basically wants him dead. And Ahab at that point decides that he wants to do all he can to get rid of Elijah. And so this is a moment where he, you know, have you ever had one of those moments where you're doing exactly what God called you to do? And somebody turns on you or somebody says, what's wrong with you? Or what's your deal? And it's like, wait, I'm, you know, you know as, as the Lord lives, the Lord God who lives, who am I serve? I'm just, <clears throat> I'm telling you what God has for me to say. But he's bringing the news from God and Ahab doesn't like the news. This is a down moment. When people, when people blame you, put things on you that aren't about you. But we, we face those moments in life. And Elijah did. And so, so that's a down moment. But now, but next, there's a high moment. This is found in 1 Kings 17, 2 to 6. And this amazing provision of God, incredible provision of God. So God says to, to Elijah, he says, I want you to go to this one area, this where this ravine is, and I'm going to take care of you. So he goes there, and we read this in verse 6 of chapter 17. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. He has this running brook that's providing water, and he got special delivery, heaven-sent meals twice a day. <laughs> no bill, no charge, just food. You go, man, that's a high point, right? And, and some of you are experiencing right now in, in, this, in this time of, of COVID and all that's going on, some of you are like, you know, it's crazy. But the brook keeps running and the water keeps coming and I have enough. I've talked with more people in the last four or five months. One of my opening lines when I'm talking to people is to say to them, I just say, how are you doing? And I've had more people say to me, you know, actually, um, they're kind of apologizing. I, I, you know, actually, I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> but keep it quiet. You know, they, so many people are struggling. And they say, yeah, God's been providing. And I have plenty. And, they're almost, and they're, they almost feel bad that they're doing well. So here, Elijah is. It's, it's, a, it's a drought, but he has running water and food. But those are, here's what I say to you. If God's providing for you in a difficult time, thank him. Praise him. Give him praise. Celebrate that. That's a high moment. Be appreciative. And I'll tell you what, something else. If somebody else is doing well, don't make them feel bad for it. Bless them. Because there may come a time when you're doing well and they're not doing well and they can bless you, right? But that was a high moment for Elijah. But then, all of a sudden, on this roller coaster, all of a sudden, he goes to a low moment. 1 Kings 17, 7. The provision runs out. So look at verse 7 of chapter 17. Sometime later, the, book, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. So here's Elijah. The brook's flowing. It's going great. He's, it's a high moment. And all of a sudden, it stops. No more water running. And by the way, no water in a desert. What happens eventually? You die. This is a low point. And some of you say, man, that's where I am right now. 
The brook was running. The water was coming. I had what I need. And all of a sudden, boom, it got cut off. Man, those are moments you need courageous faith to say, God, I need help. I cry out to you. But for Elijah, now he's at a moment where the provision's gone. And it's a low moment. It's a struggle. It's difficult. We come to those times in our lives as well. But then... The roller coaster, then there's, there's a high moment. Here's the next thing, the high moment. First Kings 17, 8 to 16, and, and a new amazing source of provision. God says, okay, the brook stopped running, but I'm going to provide for you anyways. God says, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to provide for you. So, I, so God says, I want you to go to the region of Sidon, and there's a, you're going to find a widow there, and she's going to provide food for you. So he goes there. He follows God's leading. He goes there. There's this woman collecting sticks. He sees her. And, and somehow, as a prophet, he knows this is the woman. So he says to her, can you get me a drink of water? Drink a drop. That's a tough thing to ask. But she goes, starts going to get the water. She says, oh, and by the way, could you make me a little bit of bread and give me some water and some bread? And this woman says to him, sir, I'm collecting these sticks to go to my home because I have a little jar of some flour and a little jug of some oil. And I'm taking these sticks to make a little fire and cook some bread for me and my son and then we're going to die. He says, we're starving to death. We're on the edge of life and death. And I'm right now collecting these sticks just to make a fire and cook our, 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 our last meal, our last supper with me and my son, and then we're going to die. And Elijah says, no, you're not. He says, because that little jar of flour and that jug of oil will not run out until the drought's over. Whether it's months or years, it doesn't matter. Every day when you go to that jar, there will be flour. Every day when you go to that jug, there will be oil, and you'll have food every day to eat. That's exactly what happened. High point, <laughs> right? Miraculous provision in a difficult time. Some of you right now are going, you know what? I don't even know how I'm making it week by week, but every week I have enough. I don't even know quite where it's coming from, but it's there. Praise God. God is good. In those moments, celebrate that. Acknowledge that God is the one providing. And so, and so Elijah has a, this, this high moment where now he's, he's got a place to stay. He's got food provided. God's doing this miracle. He can continue doing his ministry. Wonderful. Everything's great. But then the roller coaster goes down, and he gets to a low moment. All right? And the low moment is that the widow's son dies. Look with me at chapter 17 of 1 Kings, verses 17 and 18. It says, sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house, this is the woman with, the, with the, the flour and the oil, the woman who owned the house became ill. Her son became ill. He grew worse and worse, and finally he stopped breathing. Now watch this. She said to Elijah, what do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? It's like, down, down. I mean, he's serving the Lord. He didn't kill her son, but she's blaming him. She's, she's putting on him. Have you ever been there where someone says, it's your fault? And you're like, I didn't have anything to do with it. What do you, I mean, and somebody just turns. And so so he, this woman's seeing God's reason, but, but all of a sudden she's, now she's in the pain of the loss of her son. You can understand, you can sympathize, right? But she's blaming him. This is a low point. And we get there sometimes where, where people turn on us, where people blame us, where we didn't have anything to do with it. And yet people seem to treat us a certain way. That, that, and so here's, here's Elijah, a great man of faith and courage following God. But he has moments where people turn against him. But So now you're at the bottom. But all of a sudden now, you know, click, 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 going up, up to the top of the, on the roller coaster here. And all of a sudden there's a high point. The sun's raised to life. Chapter 17, verses 19 to 24. And so what happens now is, is he, you know, Elijah prays, he cries out to God, and in verse 22, we read this. The Lord heard Elijah's cry, and the boy's life <gasps> returned him. He who wasn't breathing breathed again, and he lived. Elijah picked up the child, carried him down from the room into the house, and gave him to his mother and said, look, your son is alive. High point. God's power, resurrection, the glory of God. You go, man, that, that's... But are, are you starting to get the feeling of Elijah's life? <laughs> that it wasn't always high point, high point, high point, high point. False accusations, anger, political tension with the king being mad at him. And so up and down and up and down. So now, so now uh, th this, this child is, is raised to life. But now there's a new low. Elijah is confronted by Ahab, the king. The king finds him. They're interacting. 
And so now there's a new low. And this is in 1 Kings 18, verses 16 to 18, where he's confronted, accused, and hated by King Ahab. So in verse 16, we see that Ahab went to meet with Elijah. This is now, we're now in chapter 18 of 1 Kings. Uh, when, when Ahab went to meet Elijah, when he saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? You're the problem with Israel. You're the troubler. Now, you know what the truth was? Elijah loved his people. And he was laying his life down to bring the truth to them. Because what had happened is the people of Israel had turned their hearts hearts and their backs against God. And they started worshiping a false fertility god named Baal, who was like the god of lightning, thunder, the storm, and the harvest. And instead of worshiping Yahweh, the one true God, they started worshiping this false god, Baal. And Baal's sort of goddess girlfriend, Asherah, another false goddess, Asherah. And there were prophets to Baal and prophets to Asherah. And, and there, were, there, there were these people serving these false gods. And the people of Israel had turned their hearts away from God and were turning their hearts towards false gods. That's why God sent Elijah to go and say, there's not going to be any water. Because here's what happened. If you've ever walked this road, if you've had, a, if you've had a, a adult child who's become addicted to, to, to drugs and they're a drug addict and they're destroying their life and there's a point where you finally have to say, I can't give you any more money, I can't let you stay in our house, you're destroying your life, you're destroying the people, right? and you have to step back into that hard love. God is saying to the people of Israel, it's hard love time. I'm gonna stop the water till your heart, bring your hearts back to me. I need to do something to wake you up because you are, you're walking down a, a road of destruction by worshiping Baal and Asherah and turning your back on me. And God sends Elijah to be his messenger. And then the king says, it's all your fault, Elijah. It's all your fault. And, and so, so Elijah is being faithful to God's call. And the king says, is that you, you troubler of Israel? You're the problem. You know who the problem was? Ahab and his wife Jezebel. But he flips it and tries to blame it on Elijah. That's a low point. When lies are being spoken about you and you're being told you're the problem when you're not the problem. Now, in the moments that we are the problem, we got to deal with that. But this is not, this is not the case here. Elijah is, is, is following God. And so th- th- there's, there's this low point. You know, you're, you're the troubler of Israel. And then, then Elijah, inspired by the Spirit of God, says, okay, it's time. It's time that the truth about these false prophets comes to the surface. So Elijah says, here's what we need to do. And this is a big confrontation. He says, we're going to meet on Mount, Car- Mount Carmel. And you bring all the prophets of Baal and all the prophets of Asherah. And so, so continuing on in chapter 18, he says, Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Jezebel is King Ahab's wife. She's feeding all the false prophets. And they're feeding lies to the nation. And so, so Elijah says, Okay, it's time that we see who's truly God. So they go up on Mount Carmel. And the 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah, they build their altar to the false gods. And Elijah builds an altar to Yahweh, the one true God. And they put a sacrifice. The the prophets of Baal and Asherah put a sacrifice on their altar. And Elijah puts a sacrifice on the altar. And then Elijah says, okay, you pray, all 850 of you, you pray to Baal, by the way, the God of lightning. Because he says, so fire will come from heaven and consume the offering. If anyone can do that, it's the God of lightning, right? Okay, Baal, God of lightning and thunder, the storm and fertility. You know, you, or, or, or Asherah, God, you bring fire from heaven and consume the offering. So all day long, the 850 false prophets are yelling, screaming, singing, dancing, crying out to these false gods, but nobody hears because there's no one there. There's no one home. False gods are false gods. And finally, Elijah. It's his turn. And he says, okay, before I ask God to do his thing here, why don't you pour buckets of water over the offering? Get it totally drenched. Okay, do it a second time. Do it a third time. In the ancient world, three times was sort of like the holy, holy, holy. If somebody's repeated three times, that's as far. It's, he said, it's, it's so drenched that if you put a match to it, it wouldn't light, All right? And then, high point. So, the, the, next, the next high point is that at this point, God shows up. And God does what only God can do. And so, look with me at, at 1 Kings 18, 20 to 39. And we're going to go down to verse 38. So, so, 
they've done their thing. Now it's Elijah's turn. It says, then the fire, this is verse 38 of chapter 18. Then the fire of the Lord fell. I love this. And burnt, so fire from heaven falls and burnt up the sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the soil and licked up all the water in the trench around the sacrifice. Then all, when all the people saw this, they fell on their faces. They fell prostrate and cried, the Lord, he is God. Yahweh, he is God. Yahweh, he is God. They finally get it. That's what it took for them to finally realize that Baal was false, Asherah was false, and Yahweh is the one true living God. High moment, right? I mean, we know Elijah didn't win the victory. God won the victory. But God did it in such an amazing fashion, it was absolutely undeniable. So you kind of go, okay, now Elijah is going to be on a high for like months. I mean, look at God's victory. Look at what God did. Next time we see him, he's depressed and discouraged. He, have, you ever, have you ever noticed in your life that sometimes the greatest troughs and low points and struggles come right after something really wonderful happens? You say, how did I get here? I was just there, and now I'm down here. And so for Elijah, he hits this low point. Now, here's why he hits the low point. When Jezebel, Ahab's wife, hears what happened, and that all her prophets were basically you know, lost and wiped out, she says, I am going to have Elijah killed. Now, he's just watched God deliver him 850 against one and God's power. But, but he, he hits this low point of kind of, of fear and depression. Look at chapter 19 and verses one through five. And we'll pick it up in verse three. We read this. Elijah was afraid after he's threatened by Jezebel. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. I mean, he's hiding out. He's getting away. Now he's by himself. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. He wasn't threatening to take his life. That wasn't the point. He was saying, God, if you will, I'd rather be dead right now. If you're willing to, take my life. He's not, he's not talking about suicide, but he's saying, God, that's how I feel right now. And then he says, I have had enough, Lord. He said, take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and took a nap. He fell asleep. You ever been there? You there right now? Most of us have at one moment or another. And sometimes, sometimes the weirdest thing, sometimes it's after the greatest wonderful moment, and all of a sudden we're like, man, we're, now I'm down here. And, and so I want to say something to you. If, you. if you have those moments where you really struggle, Elijah was a man of God who believed in the power of Yahweh and followed him courageously, and he still had down moments. Don't beat yourself up in those moments. Ask God to bring you through the trough and bring you back up again. But don't look and say, how can somebody who loves God have a moment like this? Elijah loved God passionately. He saw the power of God come down from heaven. And he still dealt with fear and anxiety and it would seem like just discouragement. He kept holding to God. He didn't take his own life. He said, God, if you'd like to, you can, you know. He said, that's how I feel. He's low. He's low. And then there's this kind of beautiful, tender moment where there's this, this high of, of what I call the tender care of a loving God. Chapter 19, verses 6 to 9. And in 1969, he, he basically, God comes to him, and God says to him, you know, what are you doing here, Elijah? Not just what are you doing here physically, what are you doing? What's, you know, what's going on? Tell me what's going on. Almost like a loving parent with a kid who's kind of down saying, what's, how, what are you doing? Where are you at? How are you doing? And listen to his response in verse 10 of chapter 19. He replied, I have been very zealous. I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant. They've torn down your altars. They put your prophets to death with a sword. And I, I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. And so what happens is, you know, he, he got, God comes alongside of him and God provides for him. And then he's discouraged. So, so God's provision, we see God's provision. I'm going to have to paper clip my, the breeze is knocking my Bible around here. Just a second. There we go. And so look with me, look at me at verse six, or verse five. We read this. All at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. And he looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. So here's Elijah. He's, he's, 
Down, he's discouraged. And then God shows up. And I love this picture, this tender touch of God. So, so Elijah is down. He's saying, I'm the only one left. I'm alone. God, if you're willing to, you can just take my life. I've, just, I've had enough, right? And then God shows up. And through all of this part, Elijah's basically kind of down. But God shows up. And I, I see it almost like, like a tender parent kind of sitting next to him, kind of rubbing his back or patting on my head saying, hey, it's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. So God says, God says to him, get up and eat. Have a snack. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. So God just kind of comes near him and comforts him and says, Elijah, it's going to be okay. Now you read that, and there's this tender moment of God caring and this kind of up moment. But then God says to him, you know, God kind of asks him again, okay, how are, you, how are you doing? Where are you at? And so he says, Lord, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty, the Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, put your prophets to death with a sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me. And so, so God says to him, and, and this, this is a, a wonderful moment. God says to him, this is verse 11, of, uh, verse 11 of chapter 19. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. And I love this. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And then after the fire came a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face, went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. And so now God is speaking to him. God says, Elijah, come out. And he sees these three amazing, massive kind of, you know, catastrophic signs and, and you know, incredible work of God. And then God says, now I'm going to whisper to you. And this gentle whisper speaks to Elijah. That's a high moment. Have you had moments where God has spoken to you? I've never heard God with my ears, but I've heard God in my heart. In those moments, God says, says things like this, very quietly, hang in there. I haven't forgotten you. I still Love you. We're going to make it through this. We are going to make it through. There's times where God just, and if you're not listening, you don't hear the whisper of God, the whisper of the Holy Spirit saying, I am with you. I love you. I haven't forgotten you. I know you're down. I know you're struggling, but I am with you. In those down times, listen. Not, the, the enemy wants to speak lies, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but God wants to speak the truth to you. Hear him whisper his truth. You are loved. You matter to him. So that's a high point. And then the, the next low point, and I call this the same narrative and struggles. It's interesting, if you, if you read up in verse 10 of chapter 19, and then you jump down to verse 14, here's what you discover. You know, Elijah is down, he's discouraged. God comes to him, God does this great work, and God speaks to him, and then God asks him, now, are you okay now, Elijah? So look, look at verse, the end of verse 13. Then the voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? The same question is asked a second time. And he replied, now watch this. If you, look, if you just look, if you have your Bible, but look at verse 10 and verse 14. He replies exactly the same way in verse 14. He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with a sword. And I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. He just says, I, I'm still here, God. I'm still down. Do you get the picture? God comes and says, why are you here? I'm discouraged. I'm the only one left. The, you know, the people have turned their hearts away from you. And then God comes to him and speaks to him and cares for him and whispers to him. And then he says, Elijah, okay, now what are you doing here? How are you doing? And he doesn't go, I'm great now, Lord. It's wonderful. What does he say? Same. <laughs> There's times like that too where it takes, that, that, that the low lingers, right? But you hold on with courageous faith and you keep walking with God. And then the, 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 the last part we're going to look at today in terms of the text is the up, a high. I call this a new mission and truth and being reminded you're not alone. So, so then God comes, and I love this. So, so Elijah is down and struggling. God cares for him and comforts him. He says, I'm still down and struggling. He says, okay, God says, okay, well, now here's the deal. I got a next mission for you. I got a project for you, Elijah. I want you to anoint a new king here, I want you to anoint a new king over here, and I want you to anoint a prophet, who's, Elisha, who's going to follow after you. So Elijah says, I'm still struggling. God says, okay, here's part of the way we're going to get you out of that. We're going to get back to work. You're going to go do what, what prophets do. You're going to go anoint some kings and anoint another prophet. 
and we're going to get back to it. And you know, there's times where, where the, the, the high point is just serving the Lord, even when you're coming out of a tough time. I think one of the, one of the greatest things, uh, one of the toughest things about all of this COVID thing is that so many people who are part of Shoreline have not been able to do what God's made them to do. So I can't, I can't go to the retirement centers and care for elderly people who I like to bring the love of Jesus to them. And I just miss serving people. I can't, I'm, part, I'm part of hospitality. I, mean, I, I spent years cutting fruit, and fruit up for people and donuts for Sundays, and we can't do that right now. And sometimes that kind of can bring us down, not, not being able to serve. And so God says to Elijah, okay, here's what we're doing. We're getting back to the prophet, prophetic ministry. You're going to go do what a prophet does. Get back to serving the way I've made you to serve. And that becomes a high point of him fulfilling God's call on his life. And so in the highs and the lows of our lives, uh, we can have courage to follow after God and to pursue him. So here's what I want to do with the moments we have left. I want to get some le- just learn some lessons from the lows. Do you, do you know there's lots of lessons that can be learned in life through the tough times? And when I talk to people about, you know, when have you felt God's presence and power the most? Oftentimes it's, man, it's been in the pits. It's been where God's come and I thought there's no way through and God wrapped his arms around me and carried me through. Those can become the high moments is when you realize in those difficult times, if you'll learn. And then in the great high moments of life, there's lessons to be learned. So let's learn from the lows first. Here's five lessons from the lows of life. And if you're a note taker, jot these down. If you have your, your Shoreline app open, you can put some notes in there. Uh, and these, these, as always, will be on the website afterwards. If you, want, if you don't get them all, you can pull them up and reflect a little bit more deeply. So number one, a lesson from the lows of life. Don't believe the lies of people or of the enemy of your soul. Don't believe the lies. Ahab said, you troubler of Israel. Ahab said, you're nothing but trouble. And Elijah just had to say, wait a minute, no, I love Israel. I love my people. I'm standing for God. Don't believe the lies. And can I tell you, when you're discouraged, when you're down, Satan, the Bible tells us Satan is a liar. When he, when he lies, he speaks his native language because he's a liar and the father of lies. Don't believe the lies of the enemy. In those down times, God is saying, hold my hand, we will make it through, I am with you, I will never leave you. The enemy says, you're alone, no one cares, you'll never get out of this. Don't believe the lies of the enemy. And don't believe people. Don't believe the Ahabs in your life who say, you're, you're, you're a nothing, you're a troubler, you're a mess. Don't believe it. Listen to the voice of God in those times. Number two, when provision runs out, Trust and partner with God on the next source of provision. When your provision runs out, when the brook dries up, then then, then don't quit. Partner with God and say, okay, God, what's next? Where's the next source of provision? And when I say partner with God, I mean partner and work with God. If you're in a time right now where you're saying, well, I don't have the provision I need, and you're saying, I'm waiting for God to provide a miracle, you know, God can deliver food with ravens, but that doesn't happen on a regular basis. Usually we go out and apply and look for a job and go do our part. We partner with God. So if provision has run out, just look and say, what is every, am I doing everything I can do, both prayer and action, to partner with God to make sure I'm doing all I can to provide for myself, for the people I love? When provision runs out, trust and partner with God. Number three, from the lows. Death is not the end. The widow lost her son. She said, It's over. And God said, no, it's not. He's a God of resurrection. And we followers of Jesus, we know that death is not the end. Death is only the beginning. It's only the beginning. I don't know if I've shared this, in what context I've shared this. I've shared it with a few people, but when I first became a Christian, I did not think I would live to be 30 years old. I didn't think I'd live to see my 30th birthday. And this is why. I had somebody give me some different books about great Christians, and one of them was a guy named Jim Elliott. Jim Elliott went to be a missionary, and the people he went to be a missionary to killed him. He was a young man just out of college. He died young serving Jesus. I read about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who stood against Hitler and the Nazis (coughs) as a Christian pastor and was killed. So I just figured, I'm going to live as hard as I can for Jesus, and I'll probably die before I'm 30, and that'd be cool. I'll go to heaven, and that'd be great. And I made it to 30. So I thought, I'll never live to see 40. I'll just live hard for Jesus, and I'll die somehow, and I'll go to heaven. It didn't bother me at all, and I lived to be 40. I thought, well, okay, I'll probably never make it to 50. Now I'm, I'm married, I got kids, but I'll probably never, I just, I'll never live to be 50. But if I do, that's fine, but I don't really, I just want to live, pour it out for Jesus and go to be with him someday. And I made it to 50. So at 50, I'm like, I probably will never live to be 60. And now I'm married to a 60 year old. I'm not 60 yet. Um, but, <laughs> but no, she, 
She doesn't care. She, she knows how old she is. It's not a secret. Um, but, but can I say this? Can I say this? It's okay because she looks about 15 years younger than me. Can you give me some sugar there? Okay, so she, does, she really doesn't care. But <laughs> don't come and say to me, you shouldn't say that because my wife's laughing and she's fine. But, but we're a couple years apart. But here's the point. I, I would love to see 60. But what I would love the most is to see Jesus. And when he calls me home, I'm ready to go home whenever it is. Because this world pales in comparison to what we will see at, at our resurrection with the, with the resurrected Jesus Christ. So as you're in those low points, hold on to life and live it for Jesus, but know that when this life ends, what he has prepared for us is beyond our wildest dreams. Number four, a lesson from the lows of life. If you're a note taker, write this down. Haters will always hate. Haters will always hate. Let me brace you for this. There will always be an Ahab. There will always be a Jezebel. There will always be somebody who doesn't like you. And if you need to be liked all the time by everybody, it's going to be a long, hard life. Because not everyone's going to like you, not everybody's going to love you. The denomination I was ordained in as a pastor, I spent probably 20 years standing against and calling and calling out our general secretary, the head of the entire denomination, and the head of our colleges, and the head of our seminaries, and the head of, you know, I call these different people because they were wandering from the biblical truth. And I'd, and I'd say, listen, um, I love this denomination, but man, we're questioning things that are clear in the Bible. And I got to the point where some people were not only bugged with me and didn't like me, they hated me. And I'm a pastor in that denomination. That's where I was ordained. But I'm like, you know what? That's part of the deal. You live for Jesus, you stand for Jesus. I haven't been killed yet, but I have been people hate me. And haters will always hate. So if you're looking to always be loved by everybody all the time, good luck. Because <laughs> there's going to be people out there who don't like it, especially if you stand for Jesus, but that's okay. Number five, listen for God to speak. Listen for God to speak in times of desperation and depression. Do you know that God speaks in those times of great pain and deep sorrow and desperate moments? And even when you're really down. Make sure you're hearing from the Lord and not from the enemy. He's going to want to lie, steal, kill, destroy, and discourage you. But in the difficult times, if you will quiet your heart and simply say, God, are you still with me? I feel so alone. Are you still with me? He is going to whisper, I am here. I love you. I still have plans for you. Listen for the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit in those difficult times. And then there's lessons to be learned in the highs of life. When things are going well, what are some of the lessons in these moments where things are going really well? What can we learn? Here's one. Notice and thank God for his amazing provision. When things are going well and God is providing, please stop and thank God for his goodness. And be very careful if you live in this culture, if you start declaring yourself poor. And I have nothing. There's nothing to eat. When there's plenty to eat, but it's not what you like. Or when there's, I have nothing to wear, and there's plenty to wear, it's just not what you like. It's not fashionable. Go to El Salvador sometime. We support a lot of kids, Shoreline does, in El Salvador. And I've been there, and I've walked into people's homes. And when I say a home, it would not qualify to be a garage for most homes in Monterey or Pacific Grove or Seaside or any or Salinas. It, it's smaller than a garage and, not, and just, just simple brick. And this, they're proud that this is their home. You know, when you've been provided for, thank the Lord. And most of them have been more provided for. We compare ourselves to somebody else and say, I don't have a lot. But most of us are very, very blessed. So when you're blessed, make sure you thank God and give him praise. Number two, God is Lord over life, even in death. God is Lord over all of life. And he's over the grave. He's over eternity. It all belongs to him. So in all of life, including in death, Christ is on the throne. And if we belong to him, we will sit with him in heavenly places. Number three, our source of victory is always God. In those high moments when you have victory, I, I don't see Elijah after he defeats the 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah going, woo, I'm amazing. I don't see him doing like a you know, like mic drop or you know, dancing in the end zone and look at what I did. I don't see that. I see him going, God, you're good. In those moments of victory, remember who won the victory. You partner with God, but listen closely, he's always the senior partner, right? And when you see a victory, give him praise. Number four, God speaks in many ways, but really listen for the whispers. 
Listen for the voice of God. Listen for his nudgings, his promptings, his whispers. Always when God is speaking, it's always in line with Scripture, but there are times, you know, God didn't tell me who to marry. That's not written anywhere in the Bible, but God did tell me who to marry. It's not like it said in, you know, in, in uh, Song of Songs, verse 2, and her name is Sherry Lynn Vleem. She's from Holland, Michigan. She's a sweetie. She won't mind if you, you, know, if you mention that she's a year and a half older than you. you know, it doesn't, that, that's not in there, right? I'm not going to get in trouble later. Don't worry about me. Uh, but you know, it's not there. But, but I, knew, I knew that this is the person God had for me because he whispers, he nudges, nudges he leads. Pay attention when God is speaking. And then God loves to give a fresh mission and a fresh calling. Boy, in those, in those good moments, understand that just like God said to Elijah, okay, Elijah, here we go. You're going to go anoint this king. You're going to anoint this king. You're going to anoint Elisha. You're going to, you know, you're going to get, getting back to work. One of the highest points of your life should be when God gives you a next mission, a next calling, something to do for his glory. Make yourself available to serve him, to go where he wants you to go, to do what he wants you to do. Sherry and I had a wonderful experience of God's calling. We started writing together as a team over 30 years ago. And we're always working on some kind of project that's not a shoreline thing. It's just work we do for different publishers. And it's a, it's a thing that God's allowed us to do that somehow the way that we work together just works well and helps people with the things they're writing. And so we turned in. So what day was it that we turned in the book? Is it Wednesday? Two, like Tuesday night at midnight, we sent in the manuscript for our next book. We've spent the last you know, 25 years developing the ideas. We spent the last probably year and then the last three or four months finishing this book. Literally at 12.01 midnight, we sent the final manuscript in. I said to Sherry, hey, this is the great thing. We don't have any deadlines until June where we've got a study we're doing with Jim Simbola, who's the pastor of the Brooklyn Tabernacle on spiritual warfare. We're writing it with him. And so I said, but until June, so we can take like a, you know, three, four weeks and not do any writing stuff because we don't have any deadlines. We can, we can start then and we'll be fine. So we're like, oh, I've got a month off. The next morning, ding on my phone and it says, urgent. And it's from, from our publisher. It says, we're moving the deadline for the Jim Cimbala date up to April 1. Can you have it finished and to us in six weeks? And that was at 6.03 in the morning. So for six hours and two minutes, we had no writing projects. So I, 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 I emailed back to our, our publisher and I said, hey, we turned in our manuscript last night at 12.01. It's been six hours and two minutes. We've been able to relax, get refreshed. We're totally ready to go. And so we'll hit the deadline. We're on it. And then I said to Sherry, the, the next morning, I said, honey, don't check your email for a while. And she goes, what? And at that point, it's too late. She's going to check it, right? And I, she said, that's okay. Because we had six hours off. Now we're ready for the next, the next mission, right? Uh, Lord Jesus, this is our prayer. This is our prayer. In the lows and in the highs and everything in between, may we be people of courageous faith. May we walk with you, live for you, love you, serve you, pursue you. And, oh, Lord, in the low, difficult, painful times, whisper your love to us. Provide as we need provision. Give us hope and confidence to hold on to you. And, Lord, in the high, wonderful moments, let us give you the glory and feel your presence. And, Lord, I pray for each one of us that wherever we are on that roller coaster of life, that we will be reminded that great, powerful, godly people like Elijah the prophet had hard days and hard weeks, had down times, and also amazing highs. Let us not look at ourselves as strange or faithless because we have difficult moments or difficult days, weeks, or months. But let us hold on to you, keep pursuing you, and just hold on tight on this roller coaster of following Jesus through the highs and the lows. Let us hold tight to our Savior. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Before I send you off with a word of blessing, just two invitations. One is if you need prayer right now, if you're online and, you, and, and maybe you, you're, you're at a low point in your life or maybe you're walking with somebody who's really at a low point and you say, we need some prayer. Online, you can send us the prayer to the ad, email address you see right there or you can call and there's a team waiting on the phone to answer and pray with you live right now. So if you want prayer, contact us for prayer there in the courtyard here. Pastor Dennis and his team are right up the stairs to the right there and there's a big sign that says, need prayer? Question mark. That'd be where to go. Head right back there and please join. They would be delighted to pray with you and for you right now. And then also if you're new to Shoreline, 
If you're here in the courtyard or if you're in one of the cars, just take a minute before you leave the campus and go to the, the connections booth back where the balloons are and just tell them you're new. Just say, hey, I'm, I'm new to Shoreline. And they want to give you a gift. Thank you for coming. Answer your questions. And if you're online and you're new with us and you've never done so, just text the word welcome to the phone number you see on the screen right now. And if you text it to us, we'll then respond to you and just get to know you and answer questions you have about Shoreline Church as well. Well, as you leave this place, as you finish up online, as you head out of the parking lot in your cars here, through the highs of life, through the lows of life, may you have courage and a fearless, confident spirit because you're filled with the Holy Spirit of God, because you're saved by the grace of Jesus, because God, your Father, has his hand upon you. And the highs and the lows of life, may you become more and more like Jesus. God bless you. Have a great week, and we'll see you back here next Sunday for another beautiful service online in the courtyard and in your cars. God bless you. Have a great week.